There is no doubt that we are living in some just massively uh, uncertain times. You know, in the 12th chapter of Daniel, the Bible talks about the number one characteristic of the last days is that people would be running to and fro throughout the whole earth. There'd be a to and fro spirit. What do you mean by that? A to and fro spirit is that people are just running endlessly because knowledge is increasing. People think options, opportunities, and objects um, are worth running all over the earth to find because people can't settle on anything. So instead of a go ye into all the world, an intentional gospel life, we have a, a spirit in the last days of to and fro, people just running around recklessly trying to find something to love. At some point, you gotta settle on something to love. I know it's hard when every day we are presented with another object to love, but at some point, you gotta settle on someone to love. His name is Jesus, and to love the things that he loves, but not to have that to and fro running around. I can't get settled. I can't find uh, uh, any footing. I just live this toxic autonomy, just running all over the place, using my little you know, my little magic carpet, my phone to fly all over the earth every day, uh, running to and fro. But I'm very grateful. You know, I'm not here to certainly preach on uh, Aristotle. Aristotle was just a philosopher that showed up when Daniel had the vision of that great giant that was the head of gold and the, the uh, arms and chest of silver and the belly of bronze, belly and thigh of bronze and the legs of iron. It's interesting that as Daniel saw all the kingdoms, starting with Babylon, which was the era he was living in, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the head of gold. He saw the future all the way to the Antichrist. In this, he saw all the kingdoms. He, he said the, that this next kingdom would be uh, characterized by the two arms, which was the Medo-Persian Empire. And it was characterized by silver. And then the belly uh, and the thighs of bronze was characterized by Greece and the coming uh, empire. Of, of the Greeks, that's when Aristotle, you know, kind of started with uh, of Socrates and he taught Plato and Plato taught Aristotle. Aristotle then was a mentor to Alexander the Great. During this era in this prophetic statue um, of Greece, and then of course the Romans were the legs of iron and then the feet represented on that statue, uh, feet of clay and iron, which was the future reorganized Roman Empire in the last days, it would be half clay, half iron. So it's crazy that Daniel saw uh, everything that is and was coming in the whole earth. And if it stood as one giant, the Bible says suddenly a stone appeared, and we know who that was, that was Jesus. And it says, in one blow, knock the whole statue down. So even if you put every evil empire that ever lived in history into one, it congealed into one enemy, what Jesus did on the cross when he said it is finished is he took out Nebuchadnezzar, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Antichrist. It was all taken out in one shot, and then it says a wind came and blew it all away. But that's for another message. My point is Aristotle lived during this midsection, and he presented something called this uh, uh, rhetoric uh, of tri this triangle of rhetoric in which he explained the relationship. Now, this is headed somewhere because I want to talk about AI and I want to talk about the local church. That, that persuasion, Aristotle said, happens when logos, which is the, the, the spoken, verbalized word. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm presenting logos. I'm putting words to my persuasion. I'm not the living logos. I'm not Jesus. And I'm not the logos, the word of God, big L. But any time that we put words into the atmosphere to persuade, it's, it's logos. Then he said the second part of that triangle is pathos, which is your emotional reaction to what I'm saying. Pathos is how you feel when logos is being presented. But then the third part of the triangle was something called ethos, which is what you send back to the speaker the ethos is where you're wondering, that's persuasive, but is it trustworthy? Is the speaker credible? Is that trustworthy, not just persuasive? And all of this happens with lightning speed. I speak, you feel, you wonder. Is what is being said true? Now, what speakers tend to do 
And here's a good nerd word for you. It's called ethotic, ethotic presentation or argumentation in which I show you a picture of my grandkids or Dan Groves, Pastor Daniel introduces me and you, you love him, so now you love me. So credibility comes with images or somebody else's words. But ultimately, our credibility, our, our ethos, the ethical truth of what is being spoken is not simply because you're a gifted presenter of logos, words, and you really feel it. So you're wondering, can I trust what's being said from the pulpit? So here's where AI is gonna screw the whole thing up. Because people sitting in churches today are kind of wondering if the teacher and the preacher is not simply drawing from robotic information with AI typing it in, getting a sermon in 10 seconds, and using borrowed words. Because what makes the preaching of the gospel real is that you know that these words are not borrowed, they're born inside the person, they're birthed inside the person, not manufactured. Either we through social media, we could have embodied words through human beings. I go, that's impressive, I'll steal that. Now we have robotic words that are created by the bots. Even though they've never been shared before, they're first time, but they're still borrowed words. So here's what's happening here today and why I love Hope City Church, because I know your pastor, and there's no way that your pastor is ever gonna go to this pulpit and preach borrowed words uh, produced by chat GPT cheat or whatever it's called. Now, I love AI. AI can have a tremendous value to us. I love what one of my friends just recently said. It's like the gold of Egypt. Either we're going to use the treasure or we're gonna make a golden calf out of it. But my prayer today is that you would sense because of the preaching of God's word that these words are not borrowed, they're not manufactured, they're not manipulated, but what is being preached and taught from the platform of Hope City, not just this week, but every week, are words that are not borrowed from some robotic uh, manufactured thing, but they're born on the inside of the Holy Spirit, saturated in the Word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah! I didn't expect to go all into that that fast, but here it is. You know, this to and fro world we live in is crazy. And I have to remind myself that we are just passing through. Because, you know, when I do funerals for people that love the Lord, I cry like you cry. But I always remind the audience that we're crying here, but let's remember. Sometimes we cry because we think that the one we love has left the land of the living for the land of the dead. It's the exact opposite. Us in this room at this funeral, we are still in the land of the dead. They've gone to the land of the living. Because we're just, we're just passing through. This life is not predictable. I, I lived a crazy childhood. I moved 27 times by the time I was 16. Went to a different school for eight years in, the, in a row. We were saying hello, goodbye, goodbye, hello, hello, goodbye. Our whole life was hellos and goodbyes. And it kind of culminated when my father died. He died a little early, age 66, congestive heart failure. And we had his funeral in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where we were ministering at the time. And we had the funeral at the church where I was pastoring. We did it in the Lighthouse Auditorium, which is kind of a thousand seat, uh, previous older auditorium before they built this 5,000 seat sanctuary. And, but we were in the Lighthouse Auditorium and we had the viewing the same day as the memorial and we put dad's casket out in the lobby so when people would park their car and come in, they could walk past and do a viewing of my father. And then once everybody was in the auditorium, uh, then we were gonna have the family around the casket to say our final goodbyes. And then we were going to close the casket and wheel it down the center aisle and have the memorial service. So this was unfolding and there's about 25 of us. I have uh, three siblings and, and our spouses and our grandkids and nieces, nephews and all that. About 25 immediate families around the casket. People have said their goodbyes. They now have filled the auditorium. We're about to start the memorial. And it's very emotional. You've been there. You've probably, many of you said goodbye to mom or dad. And so we're all crying. And because I'm in the ministry, I'm kind of the family pope. Uh, so the funeral director is kind of looking at me like, what are we, is it, are, are, we, are we okay to close the lid? Because that's going to be the final 
goodbye. And so and we're kind of there, and I looked at my siblings, and we said, okay, okay. So the funeral director is very kind, and he folds the blanket or the cloth and does it all, removes the flowers, and the lid is open to the casket. And he begins that slow process kind of discreetly, secretly, with this hand crank, and he's lowering the lid. And it's very emotional in the whole family. We're all kind of following the lid like this down, Dad. We love you, Pops. We love you, Dad. We'll see you, Devin. Thank you for helping our dreams come true, Dad. Click. We're all bent over like this. And I kind of look over, and the, the funeral director, he's like this as well. And he's like, oh, no. he looks at me like, oh, no. I said, what? He goes, my tie is locked in the lid of the casket. <laughs> and he can't get it out. And I, he goes, I got to open it up. And so, and you have to open it real slow all the way to the top. So we're going, bye, Dad. We'll see you in heaven. We'll see you again, Dad. Goodbye. Oh, hi, Dad. Welcome. Are we in heaven? Hello, Pops. So hello, goodbye, goodbye, hello. It's just, we're just passing through this life, friends, okay? We are deeply connected to the sorrows of the streets. We feel what only the Holy Ghost and the Word of God can help us feel with the human condition as we see human nature run rampant, unredeemed human nature, the geopolitical conditions, the, what technology has produced, this running to and fro because of knowledge. All of it has created an instability, a dwindling life. People are pulling back. They're trusting the shadows more than they trust the light. But today, in this room, it is different. We are talking about another level in this room, joining in this series. Let's pick up the story, Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse number 1. And we just want to, again, greet the campuses at Katy and at Woodland and the H crew, the online, and then also all the way to Tanzania. I saw photos. There's a great church in Tanzania. And plus there's watch parties that go on in Salt Lake City and down in New Mexico. I keep hearing about these watch parties where 25 or 100 people are gathering across the country to watch services from Hope City. We have no idea where this seed is being scattered today, but God, God is good. Luke chapter five, beginning at verse one. It says, now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, that Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. So this was uh, normative for Jesus to go open air, freestyle, outdoors, most of Jesus' ministry happened outdoors. Most of the miracles in the book of Acts, teachings outdoors. And so Jesus was just ministering and teaching, and this pop-up ministry kingdom thing happens, like a pop-up. Like the people began to press around him. It became a, a bigger crowd, more intense than Jesus initially had planned for. So imagine Jesus kind of in the middle of this crowd, trying to talk, and everybody's turned toward the center of the target. Jesus is down in that mosh pit somewhere, and he's trying to teach. Maybe 20 people deep around him could hear what he was saying. But the setting was not the right setting for maximum impact. So Jesus, while he's being pressed on all sides with hungry people, realizes that the people on the outskirts are not hearing him. So Jesus calls an audible, and he sees two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And <clears throat> most scholars believe this was not the end of the fishing day, but the end of the fishing season. That they were done with this part of the lake. The fish had moved on. They were literally going to pack up and go find a new location for their boats to cast nets because these waters were now empty. It says he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him uh, to put out a little way from the land. He sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. So Jesus calls this audible and creates a floating synagogue. Church, Hope City, you have to have a prophetic pliability on any given day the Holy Spirit can call an audible outside of our strategic plans. 
and we can see a ministry opportunity that we never saw coming that day when we woke up. And we have to be willing to shift and pivot even structurally, organizationally. And so Jesus is planning on standing on the ground and teaching a smaller group of people, but this thing has emerged and so he said, let's, let's take these boats and create a floating platform, a, a floating synagogue, and I'll teach out there and create an amphitheater so more people can be reached because the pressing hunger of the people was greater than their organization. And I pray that we would see the same thing. No matter how well organized, no matter what our plans are, the hunger and the press of the people becomes greater than what our flow chart can handle. So Jesus says to Peter, I need your boat. He goes out in the boat and he sits down like it's a synagogue and he teaches the word. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night caught nothing, but I'll do as you say, and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and the nets began to split. The nets began to break. The splitting of the nets. I want that phrase to be put inside your soul for the rest of your life. The splitting of the nets. He split the nets. So then, at that point, they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. Split the nets and sink the boats. Split the nets and sink the boats. This has got to be part of your prophetic prayer from this day forward at Hope City. Lord, in the city of Houston and beyond, could you split the nets and sink the boats? Peter saw it. He fell down at Jesus. But we're going to focus on these seven verses this morning. So again, Jesus calls an audible. Church, Jesus has to be able to call an audible through our life every single day standing in line somewhere and you feel a prompting that somebody is sick. You say, listen, I I'm not a crazy person, but would it be okay if I pray for you? And I'll pray silently and carefully, but can I pray for you, huh? I've rarely in my life ever had anybody turn me down. Sitting in a restaurant, hey, we're about to take the order. Before we give our order, we're two believers, Christians, and when we pray over our food, I wanna pray for you. Is there anything I can pray for you about? You don't have to be here. I just want you to know we're praying. Yeah, I just found out, you know, my husband's leaving me. Okay, we're going to pray for you. And we, we plant that seed of coincidence inside their soul. Like, man, I had a bunch of weird things happen today. Most of, of my life that has been significant for the Lord, I never saw coming the day I woke up. It wasn't the result of planning. It was the result of availability, friends. And so the Lord has to call audibles and he has to begin in this spot. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm speaking to first and second graders here, but really the entire story comes down to this at the very beginning. Jesus wants to do something more. He wants to do something great, but none of it is going to happen unless he can use Peter's boat. Can I use your boat? And friends, in the story, you and I are the boat. So if the Lord is not welcome to board the vessel every day in your life, no miracles can happen next. Can I use you today? Can I board the boat? Can I, can I use you as a vessel? If we don't let Jesus board the boat, nothing happens next. It really is that simple. Lord, am I available to you today? Can I, can you be my vessel today, Scott? So I begin, I don't do it every day, but I do it now most every day in the shower. I'll thank Lord today. 
Lord, my boat is yours. I'm the boat. You can board the boat. Yes, you can use the vessel today. Because I'm not in the mood to always make the boat available. That's why Jesus asked. Some days I've had a long, hard night, a long, hard month, a long, hard year. I'm not in the mood for the Lord to call an audible. I'm not in the mood for the Lord to board the vessel. So no, you can't use the boat. We're moving on. There's nothing here. Sorry. I've been up all night, Lord. You can't use me today. So today, Hope City, the first question the Holy Spirit is asking is, am I welcome to use your boat, you, at any given time of the day, every day, am I welcome to board the ship? And you got to say, yes, Lord, it starts there. You're available. You can use the ship, Lord. You can use my life, Lord. So he boards the boat. He creates this unexpected pop-up kingdom moment of this floating synagogue that nobody saw it coming. Peter didn't see it coming. He's never seen his boat used for this. Lord, I didn't see this coming. I didn't know you were going to use my life for this. But Lord, I'm available today. Now, there's no fire inside Peter yet. There's only availability. He's not on fire. He's just available. But the Lord will take that. Then it says, after he taught, he said, I need you to go deeper. I need you to go into the deep waters. Deeper. So the question isn't simply, Hope City, am I available for the Lord to board the boat? Am I now willing, when he looks at me and he says, I want you in a deeper place, Scott. I want you to go deeper into waters. And this word for deep means waters that are beyond our reach, which means you can't swim and touch bottom. This, there's, it's frightening to go into deep waters. There's this place in Lake Tahoe. I love Lake Tahoe. I don't have a house on Lake Tahoe. But thank the Lord I have a friend who has a house on Lake Tahoe. How many know what I'm talking about? Thank God for those friends. And they have a boat. And so three or four times a year, we go to the, the cabin. <laughs> and we boat out to this cove in which it's the deepest part of Lake Tahoe. I believe only uh, Crater Lake in Oregon has a deeper spot. It's 1,645 feet from the top of the water to the bottom of Lake Taos. Now, let me put that in perspective. If you were going to stand on the road of the Golden Gate Bridge and look over, well, it's way down there. It's 245 feet. Wow. Takes four seconds. And only a handful of people have ever survived that jump. And they said they had a very long talk with God in those four seconds. <laughs> 245 feet. So visualize the Golden Gate Bridge from the ocean. Now enlarge that 6.7 times. That's the spotted Lake Tahoe. It's 1,645 feet. So you're in the boat, you're looking at the water, and the nearest ground is almost seven Golden Gate Bridge jumps. Now, I don't like heights, but I also don't like depths. And I was going to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump out of the boat and just float and swim and get back in. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. There's something about being suspended seven Golden Gates above the bottom of that lake just freaking my mind out. Then I realized that there's a part of the Pacific Ocean that is 36,000 feet deep. That's 147 Golden Gate Bridges. Can you imagine floating there? It's frightening. 
to be called to the deep. I need you to go deeper. So, Lord, I'm, uh, 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 depth makes me scared. I'm not going any further in worship. I'm not going any further in your presence, Lord Jesus. I'm not committing to go deeper in the word of God. I'm not committing my money. I'm not going deeper in fellowship. I just kind of want to sit here quietly, get kind of a Holy Ghost, Tony Robbins, pick me up when I come here. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Tony, but we're not doing that here today. That's not this pulpit. That's not the place for that. <laughs> this is a place where people experience the manifest kingdom and personhood of Jesus Christ and where the Lord is saying, I, I want to use you, but you won't even let me on board your life. You won't even let me use the boat. And maybe uh, you are available to the Lord, but the minute he calls you deeper, you say, I'm going deeper. And then Peter goes, listen to this. He said, he goes, Master, man, we've worked hard all night, hard. We've been at this thing hard. There's nothing here, Lord. Now, you are an expert when it comes to turning fishes and loaves into a banquet for thousands. You're, you're an expert at cleansing leprous skin. You, you're an expert at blind eyes. But when it comes to unbelief, this is my territory, Jesus. I'm an expert in unbelief. I've done this gig before. I went to a church. I, I signed up on the clipboard. I, I went to the meetings. I heard the vision. I made a pledge. I've done all these things. I have fished these waters hard all night and caught nothing. Now you want me to go back into that familiar thing and do that again? I'm not going to do that. I'll just come hide, get pumped up, get a couple leadership tips, take it back to work, use it there. But I have no energy for deep. I have no energy to go into waters that I can't reach the bottom of my... I, I, I have been kind of there, Lord. We got nothing, there's no fish. It's a waste of time, Jesus. Sometimes the Lord... The miracle is right there in the waters of familiarity, friends. Doesn't have to be novel. Doesn't have to be a place you've never been, even though the depth is someplace maybe you've never been, but the general vicinity. I've been, I've done all this. Tried to build churches, help churches, be in this, reach the city, reach the world. I've heard it all. Neighborhoods to nations. I've heard it all. <laughs> I'm not turning my back on the Lord. Yeah, I'll be available. You can use my boat, but I'm not going deep. Because that's never paid off in the past. I got burned out trying to go deep. There's no return. So Peter basically says, Master, I've done this. I, but because you said it, I got no fire in my soul, Lord, but I've got some obedience. I'm available and I'm obedient. But I ain't dancing. I ain't jumping. I ain't going the extra mile. I'll just be obedient to the basic request and I'll be available because it's in the Bible. And even though I'm tired and exhausted and we've been hard at this all night and got nothing. <sighs> I'll do it. So the story unfolds. They went from this deep place, this deeper waters. He cast his net. They made a couple tweaks to the general idea. This side here, cast the net. The Bible says the quantity was so great that the nets began to split. And he called for his partners. Now, for those who are familiar with Bible translations, it's interesting that from the King James Bible all the way through the 
New King James Bible, the NIV, the ESV, the New American Standard Bible, New American Standard Bible 1995, the ELT, the ISV, every translation to Eugene Peterson's version called The Message. In every version since King James to Eugene Peterson, they've never changed the word partner. King James calls them partners. Eugene Peterson, because these are partners. This is significant, friends. We are living in a day and age of partnerships. And you are here as a partnership. You are in the waters. You are seeing it. The nets are beginning to split for Peter, and he calls for his partners. The Bible says that they bring their boat. They begin to experience in boat B, experiences the same miracle and their nets begin to split and their boats begin to sink. And five seconds earlier, these were waters that had not produced anything after hours of exhaustive and hard work. I am believing for this same miracle in our churches, people that have been laboring and grinding all night long hard, but now they're available. They're letting the Lord take them deeper and suddenly the Lord is splitting nets and sinking the boats of Hope City Church and of every partner and family member in this room. It's not just about splitting the nets and sinking the boats for boat A. Every partner, their nets began to split and their boats began to sink. Friends, I know the promises of Scripture. Our worship team is going to come out I know the promises of scripture. I know what's gonna happen in the last days. Somewhere the nets are gonna split and the boats are gonna sink. Somewhere it's gonna happen. I wanna be in the room. I wanna be in the setting. I wanna be there when those nets begin to split. The boats are sinking because the abundance and the harvest And the manifest glory and impact of God is so great. And it's happening right in the familiar waters that have been fished. Right that you think is exhibit A for unbelief. And the Lord, he merges this sudden unexpected miracle. I just preached this for the first time not long ago, this text. I was a guest at a church, about a thousand people and. I was just preaching on faith. Saying, wow, Lord, you split the nets and sank the boats. I feel like Peter, man. I'm not in the mood for you to use the boat today, God. And I'm certainly not in the mood to go deep. But Lord, if I'm not willing for you to enter the boat, and I'm unwilling to go into a deeper place than I've been, Lord, then I don't think I'll be in the room when you split the nets and sink the boats. But Lord, I, I, I've become an expert at church. I've been, become an expert at denominations. I've become an expert at all this. I've seen so much, Lord. I've been hard at this for 40-something years. I'm tired, Lord. I've seen such foolishness in the pulpit and foolishness outside the pulpit. I've seen revival turn into division and separation and pain. And does it ever end well, ever, Lord? I've been in these waters, Lord. I've fished hard all night. I'm exhausted. But because you told me to pray, you told me to give, you told me not to forsake the fellowshipping together of the saints as is the habit of some, Lord, I'm not going to do that. So you bet. Then you tell me to cast the net and suddenly, who suddenly something that truly you've never seen in your whole life emerges. The boats are going down because the harvest is so great. Is that, you think that's possible still in America? This world with all the geopolitical madness and the missiles that are firing, armies that are gathering, with all the dishonesty and fraudulent humanity that AI is about to create, that's been created, is it possible for the Lord to find availability and depth in his house so that the nets can split and the boats could sink. I preached this message at this church 
and about a thousand people in the room. And when it was done, I was a guest. The pastor was out of town and this lady that was there for the first time, she was in a wheelchair. This just happened. And her adult daughter is her caregiver. Mom's probably 70, daughter's probably 50, and taking care of mom and wheeling mom in the wheelchair, wanting to go to church. They go to the information counter out in the lobby of this church. And they said, hey, the lady in the chair goes, hey, would it be possible for me to have an appointment with the pastor of the church? And it just so happened. She thought I was the pastor, not the guest. And the pastor's administrator was nearby and walked over and just discerned this was a sweet, innocent request and said, hey, Thursday, if you want to come by, um, there's a nice little sitting area, private, that we can sit in and I'll have, the pastor will come down and meet you, absolutely. Spend some time with you. So it was all set up, so Thursday came. The lady in the wheelchair is sitting there and she says, you know, pastor, I've just been so depleted and defeated health-wise and you know, the pandemic just so, so disconnected and discouraged. And I came Sunday and I was sitting there and in the wheelchair here and I felt something that I hadn't felt. And she said, Lord, you can use my boat. Yeah, Lord, my boat's available. You can board the vessel. And then, and then I heard about a deeper place. Something happened. And I've, I heard that your church has stepped out in faith to take on an impossible situation in the city to help remedy a situation and a testimony that's beyond the abilities of this church to really do it. Way out there stepping up or this big testimony was going to be lost and would be sold as a mosque or 500 homes. And it was like, this can't be. So this church stepped up. And she said, I heard that. And I felt something. And she said, we haven't been in church, online, pandemic. And really, where do we go? It just doesn't seem to be faith. There doesn't seem to be any truth telling behind the pulpits. But I felt different Sunday. And she's holding two envelopes. One of the envelopes says, split the nets. The next envelope said, sink the boats. And she said, Pastor, we just have had no place to believe in, no place to give. And so I believe that he's going to split the nets. She pulls out this check for several hundred thousand dollars and hands this man the check. She said, Pastor, let's split the nets. She reaches into the envelope called Sink the Boats, pulls out a check with the exact same amount of money, hundreds of thousands, we got to sink the boats. And she said, oh, pastor, we haven't started. Pulls out another check. We got to split the nets, pastor. Huh? Reaches into this envelope, the same amount. We got to sink the boats. The pastor is stunned at what's happening. She pulls out a fifth check. It's the largest gift in the history of this ministry. And this woman who hasn't even been going to church in a wheelchair shows up one Sunday and the Holy Spirit shows her that she has to let Jesus into the boat and she has to go deeper in her life. And she said, we got to split the nets and sink the boats. We got to split the nets and sink the boats. We cannot let the devil have this hour. This is the hour for the kingdom of Almighty God. Let's stand together across this room today. Hallelujah, Jesus. Didn't even preach on finances that day. And the Holy Spirit, the woman in the wheelchair, Jesus boarded the boat. 
her husband had passed away. They had a large company that was sold. And she just said, Lord, this is all about, we're going to go into deeper places with our finances, my time, my fellowship, my Bible study, my relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want the Lord to split the nets and sink the boats. So every morning from here on out, let's try to remember when we're taking a shower. Think about the water, think about the water, the boats in whatever triggers your memory. When you're sipping that coffee on the way to work, just pray, Lord. You can, you can use the boat today. You can board the boat. And Lord, you can call audibles. And you can turn my life into a floating classroom today because the pressing hunger and brokenness of this world right now, it's far greater than all of our organizations combined. And the partners, you, me, we're partners. He called for the partners. I can't contain this. Pastor Dan and Jackie can't handle it. Hope City Church can't handle it all. We need every church. We need more Christians than ever. Not fewer Christians, but more Christians. More believers. More followers. People full of the Holy Ghost. People full of God's Word. Today, I would like us, if we can, to close our eyes, lift our hands if you're comfortable, even if it makes you uncomfortable. I feel like family today. Can we just lift up our hands and say, Jesus, today? Jesus, Lord, I'm a boat. Lord Jesus, I've spent all night on the waters, God. I'm tired, I'm empty, I'm exhausted. I caught nothing, Lord. Jesus, 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 Jesus. But Lord, even in this state, God, I'm yours today. I start this morning, Lord. I start with my trip to the restaurant today. Wherever I go, Lord, my kid's game or great kid's game, God. Lord, I'm your boat today. Use me, Jesus. Do something unexpected through my life. And Lord, I commit to a deeper place in the name of Jesus today. A deeper place in the name of Jesus. Not to stay in the shallow waters near shore, Lord. But Lord, to go to the places I can't reach by human means, Lord, take me deeper in my worship, deeper in my study of the word, Lord, deeper in my uh, evangelism, Lord Jesus, of my neighbors and friends and strangers, Lord, take me deeper, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that Lord, report after report of the nets, Lord, beginning to split and beginning uh, to tear, Lord, and the boats beginning to sink, God, because what you're doing is so magnificent and so in times and so last days, God, and so exactly what was described in the Bible, Jesus, we are believing in this house in the name of Jesus. Now let's put our hands down, but keep our eyes closed. We've had scores of people in the first two services. Say, Pastor Scott, I'm here today and I don't know if my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible's very clear. It was talked about in the Old Testament. Job referred to it all the way through the Revelator John recording the words of Jesus that whosoever name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into outer darkness. I don't know about you. I don't want to travail through this world and then be lost. Jesus has provided the way, the way, the truth and the life through him. See, Pastor, I need to become a Christian today. I need my sins forgiven. I need the blood of Jesus to wash over me today. I need to be made new in Christ. And I want my name written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't want that day to come that my name is not in that book. I don't want to go into outer darkness. I want to be saved in these perverse and wicked days. Lord, would you save me, Jesus? If you're in this room front to back and you would like to know Jesus and know with certainty that, that your name is in that book, the book of life, the Bible says if we call upon him, we shall be saved. The thief just simply said, remember me, two simple words. 
and he was with Jesus for eternity. Pastor, would you pray for me? Before I leave here, I want my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I need to give my life to Christ. Put your hand up high. No one's looking. Just put your hand up across this building. Oh my, come on. You're not alone. There is lots and lots of people. Come on, keep your hand up high. Keep your hand up high. Keep your hand up high. This is my day. I'm getting saved. I'm giving my life to Jesus right now. All right, here we go. We're all going to pray a very simple prayer. All of us together joining our new friends. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, come into my life. I believe, Jesus, that you are the Son of God. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross, that you were buried in a grave and rose from the dead, and that you've broken the power of sin, the power of hell, and the power of the grave. Forgive me, Jesus, for my sin. I repent of the sins I've done to myself, the sins I've done to others, and the sins I've committed against you. Cleanse me of everything. Now fill me, Jesus, with hope and love and purpose. Thank you, Jesus that my name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. God bless you, Hope City.